Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. I want to welcome you to this month's PNG Alumni Network Enrichment Series webinars. I'm your host, Liliana Rojas, and I hope you're safe and well. Today, we have a wonderful guest. However, before we start that conversation, I want to tell you a little much. Okay, so without Further ado, let me introduce you to Kyle Hayes. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let me change here presenter view, and you're all set. All right. Hello, everyone. I am so happy and honored to be here. I'm going to jump into the presentation because my favorite part of these is Q and A and chat. So I am going to move through this um, and have this conversation with you guys. But I want to first just say thank you for showing up and thank you for taking what's being offered. My goal today is to help us to, to inspire some thinking, um, to maybe challenge some assumptions, but ultimately think about how we can leverage what, what we have to improve the, the areas around us. So that is my attempt for the day. And I'm going to talk about that through the lens of allyship. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna just give you a little bit of background about me for those of you all who do not know. I'm Tyel Hayes. I actually have, I jokingly say I've only ever worked for three companies um, and they are, and I've worked for J&J, P&G, and BET. I actually started my career off in sales at J&J. Um, and then I went to, to P&G after I went to grad school. And I spent about 10 years with the company in CMK, working for the, for the MDO group back when that was a thing. Um, I'm sorry for the East region back when that was a thing working. I worked in them. I was one of the the starting members of the male grooming GBU when we bought the brands together in the personal care side. So I worked on Gillette, Old Spice and rest in peace to our little our old baby our OB baby brand tag. Um, and then I left um, and went back to J&J. And actually spent a, a lot of time there in the OTC business. And I, I at last ended up on Listerine. And then for the past six years now, I've been at BET, where I used to lead the insights function. And now I moved over into brand strategy and marketing. So I lead brand strategy for the brand and I lead the marketing team for everything that you guys see on your linear TV show. So I am, it has been an exciting roller coaster of, of a run. And I think these experiences have allowed me an amazing opportunity to really delve into different groups, right? And be advocates for and allies with many underrepresented groups, whether that be men in beauty, <laughs> um, chronic pain sufferers, or, or 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 black culture, right? So you think about it, if you think about it through those ways, we've all had opportunities to be advocates and allies for those that we serve just in many ways by the jobs of what um, by the jobs of what we do. So um I'll bring all that with me into this into this conversation. So now, that's enough about me. I want to now get into what we're going to cover today. So our table of contents, our journey today is going to be about the intro. I'm going to move this out of the way. There we go. So you can see that now. Intro to allyship, understanding your power, understanding why we need it today, the impact on today's culture, allyship in action. And then I want to help you think about your personal allyship plan. So I want to make this very action focused. All right. So I want to start off with, we're going to do a little bit of jumping through time. And Martin Luther King is one of my personal heroes, just for a number of reasons. But I want to actually walk through a bit of this quote. And this is, and obviously this is from, uh, from over 50 years ago. But it, but, it, but, but it resonates well in the reason why we need allyship right now. So the quote reads, I must confess that over the past years, I've been gravely disappointed with the, uh, with the white moderate. I have also reached the, the recommended conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizens council, counselor or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate, who are more devoted to order than to justice, who prefer to who, who pr prefers a negative peace with which is the absence of tension to a positive peace which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you on your goal you seek, but I can't agree with you in your methods of direct action, right? So when you think about this, this is a really wonderful example of how people can be on, on the journey with you, but they're not jumping into allyship with you to really help you kind of change. And what, and what we see these words echo, you know, decades later and centuries before that and decades later, and they're still being talked now. 
about the idea that as people, you know, as as Rihanna said at the Image Awards like two years ago, she called on white Americans to to have their friends pull up on this on this struggle. If we're going to be a part of this, then we all have to pull up and really be and really be and really be in into it. All right. So that 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 quote kind of grounds historically and currently where we are now in this space. So I'm going to give you a, a definition first. Definition of allyship. An article for Forbes defines it as any person that actively promotes and aspires to advance the culture of inclusion through intentional, positive, and conscious efforts that benefit people as a whole. And when we think about on, on what that means, it, it means you're moving along the spectrum, that you're moving from sympathy to empathy to allyship. And a, and a question that I think we should take as inventory is based on the issue, because there's so many in the world today, right? There are green issues, there are race issues, and there, and there, there are religious issues, class issues. Where are, we, where are we falling on the spectrum? Sympathy, empathy, or allyship? And I'm gonna give you one more later at the end after we kind of get through this. But we're gonna start with, with these three. So allyship ultimately is about aligning with and applying your power to someone else for radical inclusion. And I think those big words there are aligning with and applying your power. That is what separates allyship from just being sympathetic about someone or empathetic to, to want to help them. It's like, how am I taking the power that I have to provide to someone else to help drive radical inclusion? And when you think about it, it's all about letting your power rise. What is your individual power? How are you letting that rise up and be a part of, the, a part of this overall change? And it's ultimately centered around the idea that I can support you without fully understanding, appreciating, or holding you accountable, right? I can, I can jump in and support without all the information, without every T being, every T being crossed and every I being dotted. I can jump in without knowing what the income is gonna, or what the outcome is gonna be. Because some of these, these issues, especially big ones, are big and hairy. And if we are waiting for a, the final solution, then we won't make progress. And so a big practice in yoga, I'm a, I'm a big yogi, a big practice in yoga is the idea of progress over perfection. And we have to show up to the situation, take what we are offered, do what we can, apply our power, but really seek to make progress over perfection. Perfection is where we, is where we often stumble because without that, then we won't move, okay? Because what we do know to be true is that the world is screaming for everyone to be seen. I love this, this cultural movement that we're in. And I, I love that everyone is standing up and saying, see me, right? And I think that it's, so it's not just marginalized groups. As marginalized groups raise power, general segments of the majority group are saying, don't forget about me, right? So these are all protest signs that I pull from the internet from various protests. And I think it's really interesting, like whether you are a proponent of unborn lives, of straight lives, of black lives, trans lives, blue lives, all lives, whatever sign you're holding, ultimately what everyone is saying is, I just wanna be seen. And I want people to kind of know, know that I'm here. I wanna be valued for my contributions. Now, our, our challenge is, what that means is, your sign can't, over, can't overshadow mine. We can't be forced to try to push signs in front of each other, right? How can we all co coexist so that we all really matter? Versus we matter only, only as long as my sign is in front of your sign. Because what we know to be true, and I always like to tie this back, especially for, for most of us who are working in some kind of commercial space, right, is the idea that inclusion and innovation are wonderful for both the business and the society. And I think that oftentimes, sometimes we may not have as much personal power, but we may have a ton of professional power. We may have a PL that we um, operate or PL that we influence, right? So the idea that I'm all, I'm very committed, and so much research has been done around the idea that inclusion and innovation are intricately connected and being very thoughtful about what that means is how we will then both grow grow our businesses and society and we need to challenge some of these mental models a few mental models that that come into in that are culturally a part of america that are in baked in the fabric of our country of this country right i'm i'm i'm, I'm gonna speak under this u.s lens in this slide what is, what is steeped in an American way of existing is the idea of scarcity, is that we make the assumption that we cannot coexist, right? And if we go back to the earliest migration of Europeans into the US, 
it became very clear once the Europeans got here that they couldn't coexist with the Native Americans. We can't, I can't coexist. So we will then create a story, a narrative, and whether that be God told me this is my land, or I'm going to get into secret contract negotiations and, and, and steal land from you, or I'm gonna outright take things from you. Ultimately, that mindset was one of, it. there isn't enough for all of us to exist. So I, I, I want you to go so I can have. When you move into abundance, you realize that this growth, we can all eat. There's enough for all of us. And I often talk about many people who struggle, who are in any majority group, who struggle with the idea of, I feel like my power is being taken away, my identity is being taken away, my life matters too, right? Everyone has a sign. My life matters too. I, I say in the, let's, I, I cannot fix what happened hundreds of years ago. None of us can, because we are all here now. We are only, we are only being offered what is present to us right now. So with that being said, all I can do is say, how do we grow the pot in a way that the growth is much more equitable? And if we grow through abundance, then we can all retain and we can all eat and, and we can all live well. But if we come at it from a space of scarcity, then it means that I have to then make a choice on what I'm gonna support, who I'm gonna get, I'm get behind, which may be very well linked to my personal ambitions versus what society needs, okay? Because what we know is that the interests of the company, the people, and the culture are all linked. So by ensuring that we are, that each are, are playing an engaging active role in driving an inclusive environment, we can really unlock some of that sustained energy to improve and move forward in society. And I wanna start off talking about how we got here. And I think that the idea is, how do we come to a space where, and I'll go back to our founding of America, Europeans come to America and then realize, oh my goodness, I have to now, the scarcity model, I'm going to now take, right? It's all, it's all rooted in bias. Bias is what, is what forms those conclusions. The most atrocities are, with the human, human condition are rooted in a bias. And what we know to be true is that bias is natural. Bias, bias is real, bias is very natural. It takes time to change bias and it's worth it in the end. We know that the community benefits from all of us being much more knowledgeable and we have to be very thoughtful about how we move through that. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about bias because I do think that if we don't address the bias in the system, then we can't move to allyship. And bias in many ways is one of the, one of the biggest reasons why it's hard for us to be accountable. It's hard for us to really lean in. It's hard for us, as Rihanna says, to pull up because the bias is telling us a story about the situation as we are receiving it through our own lens. So I'm gonna take a minute and just talk a little bit about what bias is. And many of you have probably been through some type of bias training, but it's always good to have a, a refresher. So our unconscious social, so, social biases form involuntarily from our experiences. We've been uh, repeatedly exposed to stereotypical gender roles. These associations become automated in our long-term memory. These biases are subconsciously reinforced on a daily basis. Being unaware of our automatic unconscious beliefs and attitudes, we believe that we're acting in accordance with our conscious intentions. And in fact, it is, us, it is our unconscious in the driver's seat. Therefore, it is possible for us to treat others unfairly, even when we believe it is wrong to do so. And I think that's really, really important here. It is possible for us to treat others unfairly, even when we believe it's wrong to do so, because the bias is what's driving the decisions. And what cognitive neuroscience has taught us is that most decisions that, um, that we make are so unbelievably contaminated with, with our biases and that our assessments are never as objective as we think they are. So when we are looking at whether it be a candidate's resume or we're looking at a social issue or we're looking at a business problem about why we need to target a certain group of people or build innovation around a certain group of people, we, have to, we, would, be, we would be fooling ourselves if we did not think that our biases don't come into play. I will, I'll pause and I'll tell many stories today. I have a friend who works in education, an education nonprofit. She's left the public sector and gone private. And we were, and we were talking about her, um, her, her company. They are an education nonprofit focused on closing literacy gaps, but yet there's no diversity in their leadership team. And what I said is like, wow, it's interesting because we now know that effective 20, 2016, kindergarten class became majority of people of color, children of color, which means the majority of parents are of color. So with that being said, why, why are we still having conversations about whether diversity is an option or not in education, right? But you see, because bias sits in the system and these things are all kind of there, all right? So we know that, that this is here, that it really does show up, it does exist, 
And what I want to be thoughtful of is, is now talk a little bit about how we get, how, how, how is it so constantly reinforced? And now that I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm settled in media now and working and building con content around it, what we know is that the power of media is, 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 is universal and pervasive in society. Right now, most, most researchers show that people see upwards of 10,000 ads per day especially with the, with the onslaught of social media and the penetration of social media, we are constantly being seen images and images have whispers in them that either reinforce bias, challenge it, but most of it is really rooted in bias, right? And we all know some of those stats, small things like black people are disproportionately shown as poor. If they are 69% of the black people that are shown in media are shown, are shown from a space of poverty. Right, so therefore, if seven out of 10 times in which you see a, a black person, they are seen in media from a space of poverty, it's no surprise, like then that's what you assume as a person who doesn't live around any black people. I don't live in a neighborhood with black people. My kids aren't in school with black people. I don't work with many black people. That you assume that that's how everyone exists, right? That's, that's what you would assume naturally. And media re continually reinforces that as a, as a model for how they, how they build their business. And what we know is the power of media messaging tends to be heightened in cases in which there's no direct experience or other knowledge with an issue. And conversely, it decreases when people have direct experience. So I always tell people, your cup is gonna be full. As you move into allyship, as you come into a situation, your cup is full. I'll make an analogy. If you are now being charged at your company to sponsor a, an ERG that maybe you are not a part of, you will come into that situation with a full cup. Your job now is what's in that cup? Is the cup experience or bias? That's a question, but the cup is full. So we have to be thoughtful of what can we do to now reallocate that experience from that bias? Because what this leads to is a few great assumptions. And the great assumptions, and, I, and this is one, I'll bring back our, our friend, Dr. King here. It's a cruel jest to say that a bootless man should that to, to say to a bootless man that he should lift himself up by his own bootstraps. It is even worse to tell a man to lift himself up by his own bootstraps when someone is standing on his boot. I'm gonna go back to my sign analogy, right? If I'm screaming that my life matters and I want you to understand that and I want you to really empathize and, and align with me on that message. But in order for me to, in order for you to do that, you have to first put your sign in front of mine to demand that that your life matters too means that we are constant we are this my my issue is always second to yours all it will always be second right and so with that being very thoughtful i want to be, again translated from you know 50 years ago to here we are now because there are many disparities in society and i want to give you guys some some of these disparities because as we start thinking about allyship it's important that you align to an issue and again i think just like we all make choices on what nonprofit boards we may sit on and what for-profit boards or what organizations we may join in our, our communities. Being thoughtful about, about what cause you, um, you take on and where you align is important. And I wanna share with you just that it's it's pervasive. It's not just about race. I think there are many um, that are, but I wanna share with you some. Infant mortality. Black women die in childbirth at three times the rate that white women do in America, right? So in the United States of America, black women die in childbirth three times the rate of white women. And we have to be thoughtful about why does that happen? Why? Why do black people, why, why do, and it's a question that ho hopefully you're asking um, um, yourself now, especially for the men out there. Why, would, why is a black woman in America dying in an American hospital at three times the rate of that of white women, right? And I won't go into, into a, the main reasons, but a lot of it is, is, is centered around, most of it is centered around um, inequalities in healthcare access. But then you neutralize that by hospitals and say, well, hospitals are hospitals, right? Like they're all, they're all comparative to, to the broader global society. Hospitals in the US are generally well-run, clean, efficient, so on and so forth, right? But then you look at things like, oh, there's an assumption that black women are strong and that when they complain about pain, they don't get treated the same way white women do when they complain about pain. So now you start to see how you go down the funnel. And when you go down that funnel, the outcomes of that show this. On the right, you see here, four by 500 CEOs, of, of, of four, five, only four 
five, Fortune 500 CEOs are black. So when one, when so the community celebrates when there's one Lowe's, Merck, TIAA, and Tapestry, right? And I think for a population of our size, with the economic impact that we have on this country and our spending power, the fact that only four are black men shows you that we have a real big disparity in this space. And the question that I would ask everyone is, is there, is there a person of color on the short list for your company's CEO spot? Is there someone in the, not, maybe not, not in the first ring, the second ring, or third ring? Where does someone show up that might actually make it there? And being thoughtful about that. Okay, a few more um, um, disparities that show up. I'm gonna talk about LGBTQ youth. Um, very passionate subject of mine. Um, I, I actually do serve on the board of a nonprofit for LGBTQ youth called Live Out Loud. And so when we go out and talk, and, and, and we talk to our potential partners, one of the things that we talk about are the impacts of homelessness. Up to 40% of our, of our homeless youth are LGBTQ+, when they only make up 7% of the population. So we have to be really thoughtful, right, about what policies our schools are putting in place, about what they do with kids, because the policies schools put in place are generally, are generally led by parents, which then often does not create a safe environment for all kids. And the outcome of that is that certain kids are being disproportionately impacted by it. Elder abuse, silent ep epidemic, 5.9 million unreported cases of elder abuse. Only one in 23 cases of abuse are actually reported. So right, big issues. Last one, lifetime risk of being killed by police. You look at that of black versus white, you see dramatic differences. And I often tell people the, an interesting stat um, that we found is that, that not now we found that the National Institute of Health found is that drug usage amongst amongst the populations is equal at about 13%. 13% of all races use drugs and all genders. It's roughly 13% of the population. But yet you see the treatment of drugs is very different based on racial lines. And the interaction with police is very different. So if you're gonna have a drug dealer in a in a TV show, you probably can guess what race is going to be, right? If you're going to be a, a kingpin millionaire drug dealer, you can probably also um, guess what, um, what race he'll be, right? And so you see the, these spaces, but the point is all these things play out for us. There are grave um, disparities. So we can use that as a backdrop to start thinking about where can we apply some allyship? Because we have opportunities for it. Allyship right now is really important as we move through what our, what our culture is, where, where we are right now in cancel culture. Very, very important and that we think about that, okay? And I wanna talk a, a little bit about that. The pressure to cancel is both high, but it's not always evenly di distributed. And the reason why I love talking about media, because media is how most of us consume our information. And I love when I can like find contradictions on the same media platform, right? And the idea like, here's Hollywood, I'm a reporter, reporting on both what happened with Whoopi last week and what's happening with Joe Rogan right now, right? And the idea that we see that the Whoopi conversation has introduced a really interesting debate. The attack was swift and clear. What Whoopi will not do is talk about Jewish people in the Holocaust. That is a off. That is a subject that is off limits to people who are not of the community. I think that is a pre-established rule that every that most people follow, right? Because the repercussions are very aggressive and swift, and there there is no movement against that. However, as you look at allyship, you see now a lot of celebrities, a lot of Jewish, a lot of members who are of the Jewish faith say, hey, Whoopi is an ally of this group. She is not, she is not anti-Semitic. Her statements are through a, a context in which she has been informed oftentimes by the, by the community. Because a question I would, the, a question that the people throw out is what, what is race look like in today's world? What does race look like back then, right? And we, we, get, we get real nuanced in these spaces, but ultimately Whoopi is canceled. That was quick, that was done, it's over, we moved on. Now with Spotify, we're gonna have a lot of conversation. It's like, well, you know, the N word was used, but it's kind of what he does. I mean, all lives really do matter. So I wanna make sure that his life matters. I, I, it, it's hard for us to like really get in. And it, you see the dancing, the dancing is clear right? We don't, pre the cancel to pressure is not evenly distributed, right? Because of allyship and power and where power sits in and, pow and power stands. And we have to acknowledge that, which is all rooted in bias. 
So if we start with bias, get into power and privilege, you now see it being applied really differently. This is one of the reasons why I, I, I wish we were alive because I would love to pause here and have a ton of a ton of conversation, but we'll get to that in the Q&A. All right, so what can we learn from these examples that these issues are layered and the work is very, very hard. And I wanna give you an example that make, I'm gonna make it very plain for you on, on Tayo's personal story. This is something that I'm personally, I've gotten very personally passionate about and I'm going to start some work against in the very near future. The revelation came to me about two weeks ago that I need to, and I wanted to bring this to your attention. This is a map of the New Jersey transit system. This is owned by the state, it is run by the state, funded by the state, and some by New York, given that we run in, into New York. I wanna, I wanna show you two red circles here. The first um, red circle that I, I just drew is, is in Newark. This is my train stop. This is where I live now. I, I moved during the pandemic into Newark. And so in the pandemic, um, because again, part of my allyship to the Black Lives Matter movement is that I thought it was important for me to live in a community where a majority of people like me because I wanna be a part of the change in a meaningful way. So we decided to literally move. So we bought a house, sold a house, and this circle right here, I lived at that circle and I moved into this circle. For perspective, just to give you scale for the map, when I was training for a half marathon, I could run between the, these two. I've run past these two train stations. So it's not, it's only about five miles. So with that, what I say is, the story that I will tell you is this story. When I lived on the Green Line, which was, which is, which is Essex County, predominantly, it starts, it's, predominantly middle, upper class, wealthy neighborhoods, especially as you go further west. It gets very non non diverse, non black as you as you as you get past where the um the, the second red circle is. What I have found in my in, in my travels is that I, I had an experience with the train. The train was a commuter train. You go, um you get on, you don't see a lot of vagrants around, you don't see a lot of homelessness in the stations, you don't see a lot of dirt. However, since I moved to Newark, I've noticed that on the train tracks, there's a lot of trash. And I said, I said to myself, after seeing it for a couple of months, why one system that's owned by the state, state managed, state run, state operated, why does one neighborhood get different trash collection than, than another? And that's a question. Why do different neighborhoods get different levels of trash service? Because trash blows with the wind. As, tra as people put their trash out in trash cans, as people litter, as cars drive by, um, trash goes with the wind. And I found that it's really interesting. The question, it, the question I'm asking myself is, what do you think people really deserve? And why is it that in one state line that's only five miles apart, is there very different levels of service? Because I want to I want to argue and maybe think that maybe I think you think that different people deserve different levels of trash collection. And if it's all owned by, by one state, is it not one budget? So if it's one budget, I don't think the budget is by train station. I'm gonna make the assumption. I don't. I'm gonna get the information. But these are all questions that I'm asking. And the question that I would ask you all to kind of think about is: Would you allow this much trash in your neighborhood? at your train station, in front of your kid's school, right? Or would you align around that? And so just being really thoughtful about that, it really helps to, to, to open an idea up to what, what many scholars call environmental racism. This is an example of environmental racism, where because I don't fundamentally believe that you are as worthy as I am, I think that you deserve to live. I, I allow you to live and perpetuate systems that allow you to live in substandard environments. But then I turn around and I blame you for what you should be doing differently in that neighborhood and in, in your contribution to it, not, not any of mine, all right? The next one I wanna talk about is the, uh, the deadly fire that killed 19 in, in the Bronx about a, about a month and a half ago. Nine children um, were among those who died when, and I wanna circle this word here, space heater. News does an interesting job. I kept, I kept hearing, why is the space heater so important to the conversation? Why is the space heater so important? And then every, everything was about space heater malfunction, space heater, because what, we are, what anyone in, in New York knows is space heaters are illegal, right? And that you're not supposed to have them in an apartment building. Um, and so therefore, all this work started happening around how we were going to help come out and support this community 
and people gave money. Cardi B paid for the funerals for all 19 members. There's a fund put together. Um, and you start to, but, and everyone came in and helped and there was so much stuff. People dropped off food, they dropped off clothing. Um, but most people just turned back and went on with their lives. They turned around, I gave my donation and I turned around and I went on with my day. I wanna ask a few questions. How did a fire, did we ever talk about how a fire started in the middle of winter from a space heater, right? And we know what and we know what happens, space heater's on and it, it, it gets caught to a, a, to a child's bed and it set the, the space on fire. The question I would ask though is why is there a space heater needed in a New York City apartment? Because it's easy for us to kind of stop at the idea of, oh, someone had an illegal space heater. We look at the people, we're like, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense in my head. It checks in your mental model. Okay, that makes sense for those people. But you're like in an apartment building in New York City, why did someone need us? Why is it so cold in my apartment in the middle of winter that I have to have a space heater, right? And I think that those are the questions because the heat isn't working properly because and that's, that's what we know now. The heat is not working properly. The heat's never worked properly in those buildings. Many people in low-income housing units don't have proper heat, proper water. Um, when the build, the owners, my third question, who are the owners and what is their responsibility? There's been no investigative reporting done, done yet on it. I did some last night to better understand because I wanted to understand who, and when you look at the owners of the building, none of them look like on the people who live in the building, right? And it becomes an interesting model for what is the responsibility of, of the owner to have proper heat versus someone not using an illegal fire, an, an illegal space for fire. Because what I will say is what COVID has exposed us to is that is that lower income and lower skilled workers are in many ways the back are continue to be the backbone of our of our economy. And maybe I don't have a job that will allow me sick time to take off three days if I get a cold. Or I have children who I who, who I cannot afford to get sick because maybe I don't have proper medical care. So therefore I have a space heater in because that's my best option of me actually not getting ill. Because I don't work at home from a Zoom all day and can I take a PTO if I work in an environment that doesn't allow that. So we have to be very thoughtful about why people are in the situations they're in and how do we align around and, and provide allyship in those spaces versus in addition to the, here's my donation, let me turn back to my life, okay? So now, can those in power in the US push to advocate for better housing for low-income residents so that so we don't have to donate millions for funerals. That ultimately is a question that I'll throw out to the group. And if we challenge that question, that would then have a different outcome for us. Coincidentally, the owner of the building is, is, is um, a major donor to the mayor's campaign and sits on the mayor's transition board. So I will, I'll, leave, I'll leave that with the audience. All right, let's talk about the case of RuPaul. So in media, I wanna talk a little bit about how now a, a case has come where we've seen um, actually great allyship and movement. So um, RuPaul got in trouble for previous, for his problematic comments about non-cisgendered queens. During a 2018 interview with The Guardian, he famously said, drag loses its sense of danger and its, its sense of irony. Once it's not only, not uh, once it's not men doing it, because at its core, it's a societal, it's a social statement and a big you to a male dominated culture. So for men to do it, it's really kind of punk rock and a real rejection to masculinity. And I think for those of us who came up in punk, punk rock era, we understand what Rue means. And so that was a statement Rue had made by this wildly successful show called RuPaul's Drag Race that in many ways we are definitely seeing has changed culture. However, what happened? Inside the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community, there was both insult and anger over those words and a plan to reconcile. And I wanna talk about that and plan because in this, in this cancel culture world that we live in, oftentimes there's no plan for reconciliation. It's, oh, take two weeks off and reflect on what you did or go away, I'm gonna fire you and never, and never talk to you again. There's no plan to actually reconcile the reason why we got here in the first place. The platform of Drag Race is bigger than RuPaul now. It's literally changing society because I think that's why there was a plan to reconcile. So allyship came in the form of trans members of the community showing outrage, gay allies advocating for progress, a company, Viacom CBS, who, who airs um, on RuPaul's Drag Race, staying committed to its, to its values, and then cisgender fans showing up, showing disapproval and aligning around the need for change. So you see in this really small microcosm, 
this thing happened in a community. Most of you all, unless you're in the community, may not be aware that it ever happened, right? But you see where opportunities to quickly move. And what ended up happening is RuPaul's Drag Race viewers praise on the show for change is an iconic catchphrase. This is one of the things um, that it's done. So you see now RuPaul's Drag Race season one through 12, the classic catchphrase that kicked off the competition was, gentlemen, start your engines and may the best woman win. That has now been changed upon season 13 to racers, start your engines and may the best drag queen win. What that has allowed now is a door to be opened in this space. Since this, they have now had um, open an openly um, trans male contestant on the show, a cisgendered male that is on this current season, and a cisgendered female who is on UK season right now. So you be, it starts to show ways for, again, we can all eat. If you look at it through an abundance space and you open the doors up, then things can only grow and get better. It didn't take spots away for traditional drag queens or gay men who identified as drag queens. It is now, it is, it opened up doors for us to be more expansive. All right. So I, I want to talk about two more examples of where you see major allyship coming through an industry association. So that was one on RuPaul, one very specific example on, on one show. See Her is a, is a movement across the industry to help really drive for gender equality. What is See Her? Marketing and media play a major role in how women and girls see themselves. The power of this visibility inspires, it, it is inspiring to girls. And we believe that truth and in, inclusiveness will benefit all, boys and girls, right? I think seeing women, seeing girls differently, girls seeing themselves, boys seeing girls differently will, will allow them to actually grow up and then see themselves differently, right? How, how they see themselves juxtaposed to women. And so it was a, an amazing movement. And what I'm gonna do now is come out of the presentation to actually take you to the website. Because what I wanna do is actually show you how the website shows up. So you guys can all see that here. And I wanna use this, this is an amazing opportunity for a platform for allyship. So when you go through this website, it actually begins to tell you this story. So you can really learn. And what I wanna talk about here is it gives you tons of information on kind of what it is when it was started. But what I wanna do is I want you to see visually what this looks like. That it's easy to think to kind of see her is just gonna be about, about women, right? Um, but it's all about the idea of women and girls seeing themselves as they truly are and the possibilities in the world around them. I think that's, a, that's an amazing quote from Janine. But you also see our, our beloved Mark here as one of the, the co-chairs, right? So you have a man stepping in and saying, I'm gonna use my power, my privilege to access this. The team, as you go through this, very diverse, very diverse team. So bringing different perspectives because it can't be about leaving people out. Black women can't be left out of the see her movement and, and it still be really about see her. Asian women can't be left out. Latin women cannot be left out of the movement and we still call it see her. So you see an immense diversity at the highest levels of the actual team that kind of run and that runs this organization, right? And when you look at it's three founders. The three founders, as you can see from a presentation standpoint, saw the importance for us to move on this agenda forward. The advisory board saying, I want to end here with allyship. And allyship coming in the form of one of the most powerful men in entertainment right now, Michael Strahan. As a father of daughters, as well as working with exceptional women throughout my career, I hope my personal experience and knowledge will help bring awareness to the importance of how girls and women are portrayed in media. So you see an amazing example of allyship of a man stepping up and saying, I'm going to step up in, in this space, leverage my, my own personal relationship to actually move this through, okay? So that's one example. I'm gonna now talk about um, the Crown Act. And the Crown Act stands for is an amazing movement that I've been, I have had the chance to both personally witness and personally be involved in. And Crown is centered, is, a, it's, is an acronym that stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. The Crown Act led by the Crown Coalition founded by Dove, the National Urban League, Color for Change, and Western Center for Law and Poverty. It was and was created by the Joy Collective, a multicultural and female-owned marketing agency. And so you see now, you have these powerful women who came together. I'm gonna to go back to their, to their website. I wanna show you kind of what it, uh, what it starts with. The latest campaign under the Crown Act, they have gone after a group that is very vulnerable and talking about hair discrimination, race-based hair um, discrimination, 
from, from the ages as early as five. And this is an outbreak of what they started with of women in the workplace, which is where the Crown Act started. It was about um, Indian hair discrimination in the workplace. It expanded now to be around girls. So fuel by, um, by the research findings, you see now their earliest five film. Please go to the website and watch this. But what I love about this is if you want to jump into allyship, it covers one of the first principles. It's to help people get informed. Most people don't know these statistics and you have to mine the data. And as one of the, there are a few of us who've been, who've been dubbed crown research experts and we've been given the data and we, and we work it and we advocate it through our own platforms. And I'm one of those, those people. So when you think about this work, it's some amazing work here. 53% of black mothers who have daughters who've experienced hair discrimination say that they've experienced it as early as five as well, right? 86% of black teens who experience discrimination say that that discrimination based on their hair by the age of 12. And most importantly, 100% of black elementary school age girls who are in majority white schools who report experiencing hair discrimination state that they experience it by the age of 10. So what you see through this is that this, this issue is pervasive and then um, it is impactful, it's generational, and they give you a link here to quickly download the study so you can read and to comfort your own space. And they actually walk you through it, through what it looks like. Tons of amazing data points to actually walk you through kind of what this is and why Crown was founded. I want to go down to, to the coalition. So you start to actually see, right, kind of how it shows up in media, changing the imagery. You see such a beautiful representation of what girls look like and, for, and the fact that we can have a, we can go to an in-state where girls are just celebrated for the hair that comes out of their head. And, and they can love it how it comes out of their own head, right? They don't have to style it differently to actually drive some of that. So I think that this is an amazing website that actually helps you kind of go through. And what I want to do is just go to the about and show you how what's happened. 14 down, 36 to go. So this is an, an amazing piece of allyship by a brand and a company sponsored by Dove. As you see now, there are 14 states where the Crown Act is now in law. So you see Washington, California, is all the blues, working with state legislators. And now there is legislation filed. There's legislation filed, but not passed in the purple states. And so now this will this is trying to go federal now. And you see the idea of a brand really saying, I'm going to step in and really try to create change. And look at who the founders are. You can come from this space of deep empathy because it was founded from, from a group of people who experienced this firsthand. But not everybody who's a part of this, not everyone at Dove is a black woman, right? Or deals with, or deals with um, black hair. So, but yet everyone jumped on and said, wow, with these data points, I can really jump into the conversation. All right, so perfect. So I'm gonna start wrapping up now so we can kind of get through and talk about bringing this all together. So bringing it all together, I wanna give you, offer you now an allyship model. It's important for you to know your cultural context, know what you're bringing to the table. That's really, really important. You have to know what sign you're holding because sometimes you may be holding one of those signs and you may not realize, it may be taped to your back. So you may not realize you're actually holding it, but it's taped on your back for everyone to see. And you gotta be really thoughtful about that. Now, two, identify your blind spots and, and try to get them out. What are you, everyone has them. We all have blind spots. We all have them. I'll share my personal story. Living up, working on the board of Live Out Loud. Now, I, in, I did a, a middle school class program with them last week, and I'm in, I'm in the middle school class, and I'm listening to these kids go through their pronoun usage, and I come, from a, a, I come from a generation of gays where we had a very simpler pronoun structure. So I am really working to be very thoughtful about pronoun usage is not about me. It's not about how I identify in pronoun usage. It's about what other people, want, how other people want to be engaged with. And if I choose to engage with them, this is how they want to be engaged with. It's that simple. It's that simple, but I have to know that I have a blind spot because my cultural context and my age, even though I'm in the group, I have a different cultural context and that's a different blind spot. Listen with your head and your heart. That's really, really important. It's not gonna be all just data. You have to really listen and feel. Um, and it won't be all just feeling. Learn something about the issue. Learn something new. I think that's, that's the amazing part of this work. Combine your powers with others. If you guys don't, don't know that, that photo, those are the Wonder Twins. I'm dead, totally dating myself now. But really make your Wonder Twin powers activate and really think about how do you combine your power with others. But most importantly, don't try to eat the elephant. 
it'll consume you. You'll be really, really thoughtful about how we can take this thing on and take this piece by piece, progress over perfection. That's really, really important. You can accept what is being offered to you and then move towards progress, okay? So I wanna leave you, I wanna give you some options to find some inspiration. Speak up for those who are most vulnerable. I think um, the Crown Act is a wonderful example of that. Most people would not know the experience of a black girl at a majority white school. Most people don't know, know that experience, right? So speak up for those who are vulnerable, get the data. So those people are, are heard, their story can be told. Elder care is another example. Speak up for those people that their story is not being told, right? Get the data. We talked about that. Build, uh, um, become a mentee or a sponsor. We all know as, P, as ex PNG alums, the importance of a pie, right? Be really thoughtful of how you are then bringing, how you are um, leveraging your power to increase the pie for others so we can all then eat, right? Join an organization that directly impacts. I think that's the really important is you don't have to do this alone. It's about how do you take your, your superpower, what you have access to, connect it to people that might be doing the work. And the idea of directly impacts is a really, is a really interesting way to actually think about that. Educate others on the, on the issues that others face. Again, come, you be very thoughtful about spaces you have access to. I often talk about the privilege that I have of what, of what black women have poured into me and my family and the protection, the support I've gotten, especially as a black gay man. Um, and I think about the, in my, my deep love and, and admiration for their causes, but I'm in spaces like barbershops where they are not. And it's often my job in the barbershop to say, well, actually, no, women aren't, not all women, no, maybe just the woman you're, um, you're dealing with, or maybe you're looking at it through a male lens and I can hold space in a space where others aren't to challenge. You know, and those spaces, it's fun and, and it's casual in a barbershop, but I can do that in the boardroom. I can use data to be an advocate for someone. I can educate someone on, on someone else's issue, right? To help them really understand it. So I'm gonna add a point on the spectrum now. So we talked earlier about, about moving from sympathy to empathy to allyship. I'm gonna add one more, move to be an accomplice. How do you jump into being an accomplice with others? To say, I'm gonna jump in this with you. And we're gonna, we're gonna get, I'm gonna get my hands dirty. I'm gonna get into good trouble with you about this. And I'm gonna be an accomplice for your good trouble. That is, that is, that is a, a, an aspiration I would encourage you all to actually think about. So with that, I'll say thank you. And we'll go to any questions. My God, we have so many questions. I have so many questions. I wish we had like another 30 <laughs> to 45 minutes. Unfortunately, we've literally almost run out of time. Uh, but thank you so, I am going to ask uh, one of the questions in, uh, from the audience, but thank you so, so much. And before I move on to the question, if people want to continue the conversation with you, where can they find you? Yes, I will. I'm gonna, you know what I'm going to do? Since we're all sharing here, I'm going to type my email in here so everyone can actually have it. And you can now, here you go. So it's right here. Perfect, because I can see that there's a lot of people that want to contact you that want to definitely continue the conversation. So I didn't want to miss on that. Um, a lot of thank yous. Uh, here's one. Um, how do you? How do we help our own? This is from Gina Lamb. She's in Miami. She's an, an, an incredible. Uh, she leads one of our chapters in Miami for for PNG alumni. How do we help our own marginalized community see the power of solidarity across groups, like mm -hmm. for example, Black and Asian, versus yeah. the competition between groups yes. for the airtime and resources? Oh my goodness! It's it's again. We have to go. We have to change that mental model of scarcity. You have to change that mental model, right? I think, and in in, in, I think if you start there and really challenging everyone to think about how do we come together so that we can all grow the pie, then then there's more pie for us to all eat. Versus there's only one set of dollars, and we have to all fight for the one set of dollars. That is that is a position that many of us are too often put in. But I would definitely say start with shifting that mental model, and then find the intersections. Find people who sit in the intersection of the groups and use them as empathy bridges. I love an empathy bridge, right? Being black and gay and Southern, I can often sit in many and left-handed, you name it, I got a lot of things going on as we all do, but it gives me an opportunity to kind of sit in different rooms 
and talk about my my experience in those spaces. And, th and that can allow people to say, hear it differently from me than they might hear from someone else. Thank you. I, I love the, those uh, that recommendation. Uh, one more question. I'm hosting a women's leadership retreat. I invited a black woman leader and her group. The feedback I received was that the woman in her group would not feel welcome. That broke her heart. How do she? How does she approach this mindset to break down that barrier? Yeah, I think it's because it's about being really thoughtful about what how. What is the experience going to be for that group? And does that align into their culture? I'm going to share a very short story. I led minority recruiting for CMK when I was at PNG in my last couple of years there. And one of the things that we talked about was even though 60% of the people coming in were people of color, the activities that we had for the interns were a baseball game, a bar crawl through Mount Adams, and two other things. And I said, well, these are things that, pe that people from these cultures do on Friday nights. It was just an interesting blind spot. That we had a, a, a we had this kind of welcome environment, but the activities weren't aligned. So I would I would encourage you to be thoughtful about how do we make sure and possibly have them a part of the design process. So so instead of just inviting, have them a part of the design process. Then they will know they'll feel comfortable because they were a part of the designing. Thank you. And I mean, there's a lot of leaders uh, in this call and you gave us a lot of great tips and things that we can do to, you know, to become a part of this change. But one thing uh, you talk about all these decisions that we make without knowing that we are making them or that we are causing harm to somebody else because of our biases. How do you have a recommendation and how can we apply an equity lens when we make decisions? Yeah, I think that that's why this sit I have a really smart friend who works in politics and he's one of the, he told me something I'll never forget. He said in making legislation, he said policy is reflective of those who sit at the table. And when he said it, it was so it's so clear to me, right? A way that you bring equity into decision making is you can't do it by yourself. You can't eat the elephant, right? You have to bring people to the table with a very point of view especially around the issue of those you are serving. And that's how you are sure that that happens. I'll give you another example. Um, Diageo has a multicultural marketing advisory council that I sit on as well, where if they are building creative and they're not sure if this might be offensive, there's a group of us that they, they, they bring it to as a council. And we all look at it from our different lenses. And many of us are intersectional in terms of how we identify. And that allows us to catch things before they go out. We've caught many things, right? Because the intention is equity, but they they don't know everything and the agencies don't. So they created a model inside their company that allows them to actually have people to kind of bounce these things off of. Those are two suggestions I have for you. Great suggestions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Like I said, we have a ton of other questions, but I invite people to contact you so that Please. we can definitely continue the conversation because this is a ongoing conversation. It's not a one and done. It's something that we need to be mindful every day. Thank you so much, Tyle, for sharing uh, all your stories, your experiences. Any final thoughts? Yes, that again, move to be an accomplice, really look to get in good trouble. I think it's such an amazing, we, it, to do this work is so, this is a legacy that we will leave. Yes, we'll grow share. Yes, we can, um, we, can, we, uh, we can hit our numbers. I think the and is if we can use the power and privilege that we have to change someone's life, there's no better gift than that as a part of our legacy. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to pull the screen back to me. Um, hopefully that's sharing. Okay, please everybody get involved uh, either through a chapter, send us an email, sponsor us. Uh, support the foundation. There's so many different ways to become a part of this, you know, this united front. Um, this webinar and all of our other webinars will be available in our site, pnglums.com, and also on our YouTube page so that you can share with others. It's so important, the conversations that we have here. Like I shared, send us an email to hello at pnglums.com. Dot com, and I invite you to join us next month with Isabel Hoxton for the five tips and do's and the do's and don'ts of networking. Thank you, everybody, so much, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day wherever in the world you are.